Medtronic Technologies impacted more than 72 million people in the last year, equating to two people every second. Harnessing the power of technology to take healthcare further, each technology has unique benefits designed to serve patients. The goal of this program is to get closer to the patient and delve into the challenges and impact of each technology in practice. This is the Medtronic MedEd Learning Experience. The Invos monitoring system should not be used as the sole basis for diagnosis or therapy and is intended only as an adjunct in patient assessment. Medtronic's medical education programs are offered to provide attendees education on the FDA cleared indications and use of our products when applicable. The contents and conclusions of the following program are solely those of the speakers unless otherwise noted. The speakers are responsible for all content and any necessary permissions. The speakers received funding from Covidian LP, a Medtronic company, for this speaking engagement. For this segment of the series, a discussion on the value of NIRS in clinical practice in the NICU, we will discuss what NIRS monitoring is. To help provide insight into this topic is Dr. Scott Duncan, Professor and Chief Division of Neonatal Medicine, Department of Pediatrics at University of Louisville School of Medicine. One way to think about NIRS is basically that what NIRS gives you is the amount of oxygen left after the organs have extracted what they need. The algorithm anticipates a 25% arterial contribution and a 75% venous contribution when creating the number. NIRS gives you a non-invasive monitor of inorganic oxygenation, allows us to monitor oxygen saturations from vascular beds, either individually or in combination, and we'll see where that's important, in combination to demonstrate regional redistribution of blood supply and can alert the clinician to threats to the patient, allowing us to choose an intervention and measure the response to therapy. In neonatology, it's clinically appropriate to use NIRS monitors to monitor the different vascular beds. In this picture, you're gonna see that there is a probe on the forehead, there's a probe on the abdomen. Cerebral monitoring has been used for conditions such as hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, interventricular hemorrhage, or blood flow changes due to carbon dioxide disturbances during mechanical ventilation. Abdominal NIRS monitoring can look at questions around mesenteric perfusion changes and in infections such as necrotizing or colitis or tissue oxygen extractions by the intestines in conditions such as anemia or prematurity, or in surgical neonates postoperatively. Perirenal monitoring can demonstrate steel with large patent ductus arteriosus. There's insufficient blood flow to the kidneys due to the steel across the PDA. The renal regional saturation values will fall. These are just some examples of conditions that could demonstrate changes in regional oxygenation that NIRS would be able to detect in real time. So if you've ever seen the probe, what you'll see is, is there's three shallow indentations on the probe. One of those is the light source, and then there's a shallow detector and a deep detector. Both of these are recording their pathways for recording the distance of the photons and basically the short pathway is subtracted from the deep pathway. So the tissue of interest is about two and a half centimeters below the probe. And you're avoiding contamination from the skin, the bone and the dura when monitoring regional saturations of the brain. Here is part of the algorithm that we know that NIRS measures. It'll take oxyhemoglobin and divide it by the value of oxyhemoglobin plus deoxyhemoglobin, multiply it by 100 to give you a percentage. We know that the tissues will have different amounts of oxygen left over. The brain is a high flow, low extraction organ. And so regional saturations in the cerebral monitors will be somewhere between 70 and 80%. We also know that those values are relatively stable. That is, there's not a tremendous amount of variation. Perirenal probes will have saturations approximately 50 to 90%. They actually have a tendency to be a little bit higher than the cerebral values, and they have a tendency to be more variable than the cerebral monitors are. The splanting beds, range from 30 to 80%, and they have a tendency to be very variable in their signal 
We also have a notation about peripheral muscle, muscle up here, which we won't intend to discuss today. Here's our normal baselines for the premature baby. Again, you'll see that the cerebral vasculature has a regional saturation value of 60 to 80%, an absolute value of less than 50% or a 20% change from the baseline are common intervention triggers. The perirenals have a tendency to be five to 15 points higher than the cerebral values. And the abdominals regional saturations are variable due to the presence of meconium, air, milk, or formula, which aid in the digestion. One thing about the NEARS monitor, we talked about using it as a single site, but you can use this up to four different sites. In our cases uh, within Louisville, we have often used four sites, um, older babies monitoring both left and right cerebral beds, as well as monitoring mesenteric, as well as renal at the same time. And there is room to be able to do that on the monitor itself. This slide I found sometimes is difficult to evaluate. It seems counterintuitive when you read the slide. So let me go through it for just a moment. First, let's identify the axis, that the horizontal axis is oxygen delivery. The vertical axis is what we're showing right now is oxygen utilization. We're gonna add another point to that in just a moment. Moving from right to left, as we decrease oxygen delivery, we'll maintain oxygen consumption or utilization until we hit this critical point where decreasing delivery affects utilization. Such that the less oxygen delivery means less oxygen consumption at the tissue levels. Now, let's add to this extraction. At the extraction level, we can decrease delivery and maintain relatively stable extraction. However, continuing to decrease oxygen delivery becomes associated with a subtle increase in the oxygen extraction until you hit a critical point where we see dramatic increases in extraction with tissue metabolism failure or shock states. This ultimately leads to the clinical appearance of a very sick patient. So there's two concepts here, extraction and utilization. I like to use the example of a diving reflex to illustrate the utility of NEARS monitoring. Part of the diving reflex, they taught me 100 years ago in medical school, the seal diving reflex. Part of that reflex is the animal will redistribute the blood supply and it moves blood flow away from the gut and the kidney in order to protect the heart, the brain and the adrenal gland. So this is one way to think about NEARS, and we'll see this again, is this concept of a regional redistribution of the blood supply in order to protect the vital organ systems. If you think about the progressive changes in shock, we just discussed what happens when you get falling oxygen delivery and metabolism. Now I've suggested what happens next is you get regional hypoperfusion states. That is measurable by near infrared spectroscopy. As you can see at the far left of that arrow, the regional saturations. This comes into play before you fall into regional anaerobic metabolism. It falls into play before you get organ dysfunction. It falls into play before you get global hypoperfusion, metabolic derangements, organ injury, and subsequent cardiovascular collapse. This is another way to think about shock. And so here, again, blood pressure is maintained at the expense of abdominal organ perfusion. If you get low cardiac output, you'll get splanchnic ischemia, multi-system organ dysfunction, and potential death. The early phases of shock in which the body's compensatory mechanisms are in place, such as tachycardia, vasoconstriction, tachypnea, are able to maintain adequate perfusion to the brain and the vital organs. Typically in this instance, the patient's gonna be normal tensive in a compensated phase of shock. As you go throughout shock and now hit the late phases of shock, the body's compensatory mechanisms are unable to maintain adequate perfusion to the brain and the vital organs. The patient becomes hypotensive and goes into a decompensated state.
Please tune in next week for a new segment from this series wherever you find your podcast. This is the Medtronic MedEd Learning Experience. Thank you for listening.